let's go on to the last talk, which will be on checking constraint satisfaction. Okay, I'm not sure who's presenting, I suppose Victor. Okay, please start the video. Start the video. Welcome to this talk. I am Victor Jung, and I'm going to present my work on checking constraint satisfaction made in collaboration with Jean-Charles Réjean. This work has been motivated by some research in artificial intelligence which aims at identifying some hidden constraints. Hidden constraints are constraints that can be found in a set of solutions but are not formally present in the initial model. Finding them can help improving an already existing model, improving in some sort the comprehension of the problem, or even expliciting the characteristics of what is a good solution or not. In order to find these hidden constraints, we want to be able to know if a constraint is satisfied by a given set of solutions. Here, we present tools to perform such operations. I will start this talk by first presenting some basic definitions and then I will present the problematic of the paper. I will then talk about the different methods to answer the problematic by presenting first the inclusion operation and then by introducing the notion of properties. I will then close this talk by showing some experimental results and presenting our conclusions. In constant programming, there are three very important notions. The notion of variable, the notion of domain, and the notion of constraint. The domains contain the possible values that a variable can take. D of xi is the set of values that the variable xi can take. A constraint is a rule defined over the variable that allows or prevents some couple of assignation to appear in a solution. For instance, if we add the constraint x1 equal x2 to our model, then we prevent the couple x1 equal 0 and x2 equal 1 to appear. Constraint can be defined by a general rule, like the all difference, or can be defined by giving explicitly all allowed or forbidden couples. So now, let's move on the problematic. We want to be able to learn the parameters of a constraint based on a set of solution S. In other words, we would like to know what are the constraints satisfied by S. Our goal is to address this problem with an automatic and general approach instead of using an ad hoc algorithm. So, given S a set of solutions, to know if it satisfies a certain constraint, you can simply intersect it with the set SC of all solutions satisfying these constraints. If the result of the intersection is equal to my base set S, then it means that all solutions in my set are in the set of satisfying solutions. Therefore, my set is a subset of SC, and therefore my set satisfies the constraint. But then, we can ask ourselves the question, is it realistically feasible? We can clearly see that, in some cases, the set SC is huge, but we still need to represent it in order to do some computation on it. Well, to deal with this problem, we can use MDD to represent the sets. A MDD is a data structure that is used to represent sets in a compressed way. It is a directed acyclic graph whose path from the root to the terminal node of the graph are solutions. This data structure is interesting because it can reach an exponential factor in terms of compression and efficient algorithms were developed to perform operation between them, notably the intersection that interests us. Furthermore, because you can directly build the set SC as an MDD, you can manage to represent a set of solutions that is exponential in its size. Of course, it depends on the compression factor, which is a case-by-case, case, so no way to tell if a certain constraint can be represented. But we can have an intuition on it. Given that a MDD represents a set, we can treat it as such, so the exact same observation we made earlier still hold. If the result of the intersection between my MDD S representing the set 
S of solution and the MDD SC representing the set SC of solution satisfying a constraint C is equal to MDD S, then MDD S is satisfying the constraint C. However, we can notice that this operation is in fact a single inclusion operation. We are just computing an inclusion. Even if it's mathematically equivalent, doing two operations instead of one is different in practice. And because there are no inclusion operators between MDD, we have to create one. The idea of the inclusion algorithm appends itself directly to the generic apply function between MDD introduced by Regin and Perez in Efficient Operation on MDDs for Building Constraint Programming Models, which is the state of the art. This means that we can expect the inclusion to be at least as good as a single intersection. Let's try on an example. Here, we want to know if the MDD on the right is included in the MDD on the left. For space reason, we will represent the progress of the algorithm by coloring arcs on the second MDD if they are in the first one. We begin the algorithm by associating the two roots. Then, starting from the root, we check if there is an outgoing arc from x1 with label 1. As we can see, the arc exists. Therefore, we can create it and we associate the node that is the child of x1 by the arc with label 1, which means x2, with the newly created node. We then check for the existence of an outgoing arc from x1 with label 2. As we did previously, we create the arc and associate the newly created node with x3. The first layer is now done. For memory purposes, we can remove each node and arc of the previous layer as we no longer need them. We then repeat this process until we reach the terminal node x5. Here we try to check if there is an ongoing arc from x3 with label 2. There are none. Because of the structure of the MDD, we know for sure that there are no other nodes with the same path in our MDD. Therefore, by deleting an arc, we are sure that at least one solution is removed from the initial set. Because at least one solution is removed, we can say that there are no inclusion. We can stop the algorithm. So, we now have an algorithm that can answer whether or not a set of solutions satisfies a certain constraint using MDD. However, when we take a closer look at our problem, we are more interested in the parameters than in any particular constraint. So, is our method really efficient to learn parameters? For instance, for the sum constraints, we are interested in knowing what are the tightest possible bounds. What's the point of testing if the sum between 1 and 10 is satisfied if we can directly know that the strictest sum is between 4 and 8. Using the inclusion algorithm introduced earlier, it requires us to go through several iterations to determine what the parameters are for a given constraint, tightening the parameters as we go along. This potentially and often requires a lot of computations and constructions. The inclusion algorithm while good to answer a specific constraint, is not the most suitable for our problem of learning parameters. In order to address directly the problem of learning parameters, we add a notion of property to each node. Each node is now able to hold information. This information depends on the information of its parents and represents the state of a constraint. By propagating the property from the root node to the terminal node, we go through the whole MDD and we can expect the terminal node to hold the final result. This works in a similar way as the scheme introduced in a systematic approach to MDD-based constraint programming. To propagate the property, we need two main functions directly linked to the propagation process 
and one function used to get the results of the propagation. The first function is the transition function, to go from the parent to the child. Given the property of the parent and the level of the arc, we can build a new property that will be the one of the child. The second function is the merge. When a child has multiple ingoing arcs, it will receive multiple properties, although it can only hold one. Therefore, we need to merge the different properties into a single property. This operation, given the property held by the child, the property held by the parent and the label on the ingoing arc, perform the merge of the properties. Finally, the get function is simply used to retrieve the result. It is often the identity function, but in some cases can be something else. For instance, in the case of the sequence constraint, it returns the property of an accumulator. Example with the sum constraints, the property is a single range. The transition function is simply the sum of the bounds and the label. The merge function is an union between the two properties, and the get function is the identity. Here is another example with the sequence constraints, a bit more complex. The property is a set of range. The transition function is the sum of the bounds for each range with an integer b. b is equal to 1 if the value v is constrained and is equal to 0 otherwise. The merge function is the union of each range and the get function returns an accumulator. Because it's a bit complex, let's move to an example. We start initializing the roots property to 0, 0. This means that with a size 0, we take at least and at most 0 times a value in V. This is the base case. The accumulator here on the right is also initialized with 0, 0. The first transition is made by taking the arc with label 3. Because 3 is constrained, b is equal to 1. We apply the transition function and obtain the set of range 0, 0 and 1, 1. We update the accumulator accordingly. This means that to reach this node by taking one arc, we have to take at least and at most one value, that is in v. The second transition <laughs> is made by taking the arc with level 2. This time, b is equal to 0 because 2 is not constrained. By applying the transition function, we obtain the set of range 0, 0 and 0, 0. Therefore, we have to update the accumulator by doing the union between 1, 1 and 0, 0. We obtain 0, 1. Here, we have a merge case. We simply do the union of the property already existing and the property obtained by the transition function and update both the node and the accumulator if a value change. Here, the value change for a size 2. Upon reaching the terminal node, the algorithm ends. In this example, the most restrictive sequence constraints satisfied by our MDD are for q equal 1, 0, 1, for q equal 2, 0, 2, and for q equal 3, 1, 3. Notice that the result held by the terminal node is not the same as the accumulator. This is why we can't have the identity function to retrieve the result. This is due to the sliding behavior of the sequence constraint. So, we tested the different methods on two problems. The first one is a car sequencing whose MDD roughly has 26,000 nodes and 54,000 arcs for a total of more than 10 power 14 solutions. The second one is a nurse rostering problem whose MDD has 128,000 nodes and 220,000 arcs for a total of 10 power 28 solutions. For both problems, we can clearly see that the inclusion always stops the intersection and verification as expected. But the difference is mostly a factor 2 or 3 at best. However, the results obtained with the propagation of properties are far better 
and show an exponential gain compared to the other methods, both in time and memory, which clearly shows the benefits of this approach. So, as a conclusion, the inclusion operator answers the question of whether or not a set of solutions is satisfying a constraint. However, it might require many iterations to determine the parameters of the constraint. By adding properties to the nodes, the parameters can be found in a general and lightweight way and show exponential gain compared to the inclusion. And that's it. If you have any question, feel free to ask and thank you for listening. Okay, do we have any questions? Uh, we are now side. Can you hear me right now? Yes. Okay, we are currently trying to get our setup back to working state. Um, but currently okay. no questions from Vienna. Okay. Uh, maybe just as a clarification point. So uh, you require the MDD ordering to be the same, right? Can you hear me? Uh, Victor? Yes. Uh, you have some feedback. You have some audio feedback on your side. Hello? Uh, Victor, we can't hear you. Maybe you can answer in chat if you can't get through. Yeah, yeah. maybe you can answer in chat. Uh, anyway, and in the meantime, any other questions? Is it fine now? Oh, okay. Okay, we are fine now. Uh, no, hang on. Sorry, who who said that? <laughs> uh, Victor, can uh, you can answer in chat or you can? Uh, oh. yeah. What was the question? Oh, uh, oh, oh, oh I, I see. He's he's there. I see. Okay. Uh, no. Uh, so so you uh, assume that the variables are the same and with the same ordering, right? Oh uh, yes. Right. Uh, but uh, is that too restrictive? Um, I, the thing is, uh, for the, the test I did, uh, it was this way, but, uh, I think it works, uh, in, um, a more, uh, in less restrictive cases, but it's, no, no, I mean, that, that suppose, you know, the variable ordering is not the same. Is that, uh, reasonable or not reasonable? Oh, you mean, um, uh, when testing uh, an inclusion, I mean, you 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 have an order MDD, right? Yes. Right. So then the the question is would be the you know the variables are they the same in both MDDs? Uh, uh, yes. At one point, and then the ordering is it the same? Yes. Same, and then you know is this uh, restriction too strong or it's okay? Uh, it's okay, but um, the thing is, if you have a different order. To to um, to change the order of the variables, you have to actually recompute the MDD because you can't just uh, switch layers to invert the the, um, the position of the variables. So it's something to take into account when uh, doing uh, the operation before and but right. So so the inclusion may not be as simple as what you showed. In fact, it could be quite expensive. Uh, but so the reason for asking this is that it might be that a certain variable ordering is better for one thing, but another ordering is better for another thing, right? Because yeah. one side is a constraint, right? And the other side is the solution space, right? Yes. So, and of course, in general, the constraint may be much larger than the solution space. Right. So, so you might want to have a certain ordering for that. Then the solution space, maybe you want a different ordering. Yes, but yeah. it's, um, it's very hard to answer the question of um, what is the good order. 
So yes, yes, yes. That, that that's an independent question, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, 